So this PowerPoint is all chapter nine. I don't lecture on chapter 10. The only thing on chapter 10 is on your worksheet that I handed out. On the back side is a couple questions. So you'll need the ebook because it's like a choice of questions. So there's a certain section at the end of chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about like genetic manipulation. It's all about what we can now do in a lab to create different things. Uh, that we can build different organisms by using genetics. I again don't lecture about all the different techniques and how we can do that. And so your you know, task is out of the chapter 10, there is a section of questions you have to choose, I think, three of out of the 10 and choose whichever three you want to answer. Um, I think there's like a paternity question or a crime scene. You know, how do we identify someone based on, you know, DNA that you can find at a crime scene? So it's like you could have choose your three questions for chapter 10. So we just lecture on chapter nine, all about microbial genetics. So some of this is going to sound very familiar from A and P. They, but we again, just like when we do cellular respiration with the Krebs cycle and making ATP, there are some slight changes between uh, microbes genetic and humans genetics, but a lot of similarities as well. So we're going to go over a little bit about just some basic terminology with genetics. Uh, how do we replicate DNA? And I'd say we, but organisms replicate DNA. Talk about transcription and translations. Uh, hopefully that's somewhat familiar from some A and P. And then we'll get into genetic mutations and genetic transfer. And we'll see if we can get that far uh, in lecture today. So just what is genetics itself? And I didn't write that in. But genetics itself, it's the study of inheritable traits um, my book definition as expressed by the genetic makeup So just using humans as an example, what are certain traits that get passed on from your parents to you guys or you guys to eventually your kids? Um, what are some of these traits that get passed on so they're inheritable and they're all expressed based on what are the genes, what is the genetic makeup that gets passed on from parent to offspring? When we start talking about the genome and genetics, the genome is the entire genetic makeup of a particular organism. And when we talk about the entire genetic makeup of an organism, we're talking about every gene and every nucleotide sequence that's out there. Now, I usually have students like, uh, well, what's a gene? A gene, let's say, is a small piece of DNA that codes for something. So you have genes that control your, hot, your eye color, your hair color. You have genes that code for something. So a gene is a small snippet of DNA that just codes for something particular. Nucleotide sequence is literally like, what are all your A's, T's, C's, and G's? <laughs> and I'm like, of every gene and on every chromosome that you have. On here, we can actually see some of the chromosome. This is where we find all of the DNA. This is a bacteria. They smushed the bacteria, so the DNA kind of came out. Um, but we can see, and I'm like, in one bacteria, DNA is very skinny, but it's still quite long. And DNA have what are called plasmids as well. They're the little snippets of DNA. They're not essential for life, but they do carry interesting stuff like the uh, antibacterial resistance. Now, little refresher of DNA, because you guys have been learning about DNA in middle school. I think my kids are learning DNA. Uh, so kind of like without doing a whole lecture, it's a little bit of review. Uh, and I throw the picture up because there's a lot going on in the picture, but it's kind of showing a little bit of 
everything on reviewing DNA. So DNA is made up of a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. The sugar that's in DNA is deoxyribose, which is where DNA gets its name, deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, the structure of DNA, it is helical shaped, which means it's twisted. It's two strands, so it has two strands. And the two strands run opposite of each other. They're anti-parallel, because that's going to come into play today when we're making new DNA. So the ends of the strands of DNA, they are based just on the structure, on why they call them threes and fives. But on the end of this one is a three, and if we follow it all the way around, the other side is called a five. Where the other strand starts out as a three, and if we follow, follow it all the way around, it would end in the five. So they go in opposite direction of each other. So they're called anti-parallel. Um, in the structure, so the outside part of the DNA strand is made up of the phosphate and the sugar. It's called the phosphate sugar backbone. So it's just phosphates and sugars, so phosphates and deoxyriboses. The inside part is where you find those bases. And there are four different bases found in DNA. There's the adenine, thymine, the uh, guanine, and cytosine. Not uracil. Um, so the C's, the G's, the T's, and the A are all found in DNA. How they pair up? A's always pair up with T's. C's always pair up with G. You know, vice versa, G pairs with C, T pairs with A. So an adenine, that's the A, is going to always pair with the thymine. A guanine is always going to pair with the cytosine. So the C's and G's always pair up, the A's and the T's all pair up. Does this, some of this all sound familiar? Okay, good, at least some of it. Um, so that's the basic structure of DNA because how it's structured becomes important and how will we start to replicate it. Now, prokaryotic, so we're talking bacteria, prokaryotic DNA, it's still gonna have a lot of those same identical characteristics. Um, but slightly different as well. So DNA is found in its chromosomes in a prokaryote, so a bacteria. And the chromosomes that bacteria have are haploid, which means they have half the number of chromosomes. And when I say half the number, they're not paired. So how many pairs of chromosomes do you guys have? Close. 23, I was gonna say, you flipped those out. 23 pairs of chromosomes to give you a total of 46. So our chromosomes are all found in pairs. And if you had to draw one of our chromosomes, you would draw an X. Um, and they like to hang out in pairs. Prokaryotic chromosomes don't come in pairs, so they have half the number. Um, and their chromosomes, whereas ours are linear, I would always draw a line, theirs are circular. Our chromosomes are also found in a nucleus because we have a nucleus. Prokaryotes, bacteria, don't have a nucleus. That's way too advanced of an organelle for them. So it's found in just what's known as the nucleoid region. So it's just an area where all the DNA is condensed. Prokaryotes also have plasmas, those little snippets of DNA. They're not essential for life, so it doesn't control anything on how to reproduce or anything else. But it can have some survival advantage. It's still DNA on those little snippets of plasmids. And if it's DNA, there might be genes in that DNA on those plasmids. And those genes may control something such as antibiotic resistance. So it's not essential for survival, but it sure can give it a good advantage. Our cells do not have plasmids. All of our DNA is wrapped up in our chromosomes and our linear chromosomes. So the comparison for us, um, we're always gonna have more than one chromosome per cell. Our cells have 23 pairs of 46 chromosomes. Ours are diploid, that di just means two. Ours always come in pairs. Ours are linear. When you draw a chromosome, it's always a line. 
And it's found in the nucleus because our cells have a nucleus. Now, there are some eukaryotic organisms like some fungi and some protozoa that do have plasmids. We, as humans, do not. But there are a few eukaryotic cells that have plasmids. Now, in every single cell in your body, uh, and you've seen some of your cells underneath the microscope already when we did the teeth scraping, uh, inside the nucleus in our cells, it has all the DNA. And the DNA in our cells is actually six feet long. Now, in every single microscopic cell in your body, the DNA that's in every single one of those cells is six feet long. It's really long. Also means really skinny. And so how do you get six feet of DNA inside one tiny little microscopic nucleus? It's a lot of twisting. It's a lot of twisting on top of twisting on top of twisting on top of twisting. And I'm gonna show a quick little video clip if the audio works, um, that the DNA, this purple structure, gets twisted around something and those things twist around something and they twist around something and then they keep twisting and twisting and twisting. And maybe I'm not gonna show a video. Where's my video? Give me a second. This one didn't show any of the videos. Did the other one show? I don't know. I might have to go back and forth a little bit. Oh, I probably did put them as separate. I'm still gonna have to go back. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is. I need sound though. We had all the sound figured out last week. Let's see what this does. Getting closer. I really do hate technology. Why was this? Because it was working last week just fine. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of button. every cell. I'm going to make it louder, though. All right, so this purple color is the DNA, or I guess it's kind of more of a pinkish color up there. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell. The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. The nucleosomes are packaged into a thread known as chromatin. This fiber is then looped and further packaged using other proteins which are not shown here. The end result is that the DNA is tightly packed into the familiar structures we can see through a microscope, chromosomes. Chromosomes are not always present. They form around the time cells divide when the two copies of the cell's DNA need to be separated. The whole mitosis lie. At other times, as we can see now after the cell has divided, our DNA is less highly organized. It is still wrapped up around the histones, 
but not coiled into chromosomes. So cool. I love that being able to actually watch the chromosomes condense. I'm still going to go back and forth. So you were able to see each one of our cells has six feet of DNA. And again, it just has to keep wrapping and wrapping and wrapping around itself. But anytime our cells want to go through mitosis, I don't know why. I'm not going to mess with anything. Anytime our cells want to go through mitosis and divide, anytime bacteria cells want to go through, they don't do technically mitosis, but they do binary fission and they grow and divide. Uh, anytime they want to do that, DNA does have to get duplicated. You don't want to make a new cell without also having DNA in each of these new cells. And so we have to go through DNA replication. Now DNA replication, whether it is prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells, is what's known as a semi-conservative model. Which means if we have our normal original strand, which is all the blue is the original strand, double helix, we're going to unwind it and each strand of the original strand becomes a template to make the other side of the strand. And so what when we start with one strand of DNA, and we ultimately want to make two strands of DNA, each of these new strands of DNA has an original and a new. And so they call it a semi-conservative model. So there's always that a part of the original strand is always part of the new strand as well. Now, in DNA replication, kind of recall, DNA replication is the DNA strands are anti-parallel. And so for us to start making that new strand, we do first have to unzip the original strand because we have to pull the two pieces apart so that we have that original strand all by itself to start making copies of. And there is an enzyme called DNA polymerase. You don't have to know it, um, but it's the enzyme that starts to read the letters. So if there was an A, it would bring in a T. If there was a C, it would bring in a G, and so on. The only problem is DNA polymerase can only add to a five prime end. So when it starts to make a strand, if that strand is three, the other side would be five, um, or five, and then go down to the three. If this is a five, the new strand would have a three and go down. And so when it makes the new strands, it still has to make each new strand anti-parallel. But it becomes an issue because as it unwinds going to the left, and it can only add on to the five prime side on the new strand, the five prime side is going to be on the opposite side uh, for some of these strands. And it becomes a, a little hiccup of an issue is because it actually has to do DNA replication going backwards. I was going to say, I have so many little memes that I was like, ah, oh, it's slightly inappropriate, but I don't care. Oh, you can't even read the bottom part. I don't know how to get rid of it. <sighs> See if I go back to play it. I don't know how to get rid of this bottom part. Like this. Is there a, where do you show full screen now? Oh, because it sucks, you can unzip the jeans. Uh. I don't know why I can't, why I don't. I'm not messing with technology. I love Big Bang Theory though. So when it's doing the DNA replication, this is showing my A, my B and my C what's happening with what's known as the leading strand and what's happening with what's known as the lagging strand. So as it starts to make the leading strand, it can keep adding on, no problem whatsoever. However, when it starts to make the lagging strand, it can only add going this way. So it has to keep making little tiny snippets. It'll make a snippet and go in reverse. It'll make a little snippet um, and go in reverse. And it keeps going. They make these little tiny fragments called Okazaki fragments. But as it's unzipping going to the left, this actually has to make DNA going to the right. Uh, so they call it the lagging strand just because it takes a little bit longer. Because you have to keep laying down their little tiny primers that started off. 
and then it makes it going in reverse. And then it lays down another one and makes DNA going in reverse. Uh, and then eventually we remove those little primers and we put it all together and it's just fine. So this happens in both prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. It's just a little extra struggle when we make new DNA. Here's the video showing that. Oop, sorry. Just wanted to make it louder. Hey, I got rid of the thing. When DNA replicates, its strands are separated by the enzyme helicase. Single-stranded DNA binding proteins right. keep the strands from re-annealing. So again, you have to unzip the DNA. One DNA strand encodes the leading strand, which forms from its 5' prime to its 3' prime end, using DNA polymerase 3. No problem here, but the lagging strand presents problems. It has to form from 5' prime to 3' prime 2. It forms in pieces called Okazaki fragments. First, an RNA primase lays down an RNA primer. Then, DNA polymerase 3 lays down new DNA. The process repeats again and again. Again, it's just going backwards. DNA polymerase 1 replaces the RNA primers with DNA. Finally, DNA ligase links the Okazaki fragments. So again, it unzips going to the right. So the ones, the top strand is just fine. So as it's unzipping, it's just laying down new nucleotides, A's with T's and C's with G's. It's just that lagging strand, as it unzips this direction, it's actually making DNA go in the opposite direction in small little fragments. Now, in a prokaryotic cell, so a bacterial cell, their DNA is in one big, huge circle. They still are going to do the same process, but they're going to make that DNA, and they're going to go and replicate it going both directions. So instead of unzipping just to the right, they're going to unzip to the right, and they're going to unzip to the left. And they're going to keep making new strands. So as it starts to unzip, it keeps unzipping going in that direction, and it's making the new DNA. And so as it keeps unzipping, the new DNA almost starts to like fall off as that new second loop. So that by the time it's done, it has two new strands. Each of them still has an original strand, the original color, and each one still has the new DNA. So it's still a semi-conservative model even with prokaryotic cells. Just looks a little different. Same process, just looks a little different because of the circular nature. Now, looking at genotypes and phenotypes, a genotype, because it has that gene in its name, just implies what are the genes that an organism has. When I erased it from the board, but a gene is just what are the snippets of DNA that codes for something that any organism has. You guys have lots of genes that control lots of different things in your body. Everything in your body is controlled by these little snippets of DNA. So genotype are the genes that control something. A phenotype are the physical characteristics that an organism has. If you're a bacteria, do you have flagella or not? There's a gene, a snippet of DNA, that codes for that particular structure. So a phenotype are the different physical characteristics. So the phenotype is controlled by the genotype. Your genes control what you look like. Your genes control whether you can break down lactose or if you're lactose intolerant. And I'm like, your genes control all of that stuff. Now, how do we get information from the DNA to make all of this stuff? How do we get that information from our DNA to control our hair color or eye color? How do we get that information to make the enzyme lactase that can break down lactose? It's like, how do we get that information from the DNA? Because the DNA does control everything 
that happens in any particular organism. Well, it's through two processes called transcription and translation. It's known as the central dogma of genetics. It's the fact you have all this DNA and it has to control everything. But how do we get, I'll leave that up. How do we get that information from the nucleus? Now, I liken it to the DNA. Again, it's extremely important uh, and it controls everything. I like to think of it as a super rare book that literally would like be the book of life. That this one book has all the information needed for anything to survive. And there's only one copy of it. Like you only have, I know you've got pairs of chromosomes, but you don't have lots of each of them. You just have one pair. So I liken to a super rare book that it's at the library, it's never gonna leave the library. Like the library is gonna keep that one rare book under, con you know, under control. But if we need to get information from that particular book, but just from say page 83 or whatever page, because you only need to know one thing, we can't take the book from the library. We can, however, make a copy. And I'm like, and we can make a copy of just a small piece of information that we need. That's transcription. It's just making a copy of the small little section of DNA. You have six feet of DNA in each one of your cells. But what if we only need the information, say, you know, from whatever, inch two to three. Uh, if we only need one small little chunk, we're just going to make a copy of that one tiny little chunk. And that chunk can leave the DNA. That photocopy you make of the book page can leave the library, just like that one little copy can leave the nucleus. So transcription is we're going to take DNA and we're going to make a copy of just one small little section. And that one small little section is called our messenger RNA. It's just a small little copy of one tiny little section of the DNA. And that's transcription. Now, because DNA cannot leave the nucleus, transcription happens in the nucleus. If it's a prokaryotic cell, this would just happen in the nucleoid region because they don't have a nucleus. Now, once you have a copy of that page of information that you need, we still need it to do something, and that's the translation, is we're going to take that messenger RNA and we're going to make it into whatever protein we need. So we're going to translate the information that's on the page. We're going to figure out what it says, and then we can now figure it out, take those instructions, and make our proteins. Again, every enzyme, like lactase, is a protein. Everything is protein-derived. All your antibodies are proteins. It's all proteins. And that's the central dogma of genetics, taking the DNA, making small snippets of RNA to ultimately make our proteins. A polypeptide is just a chain of amino acids. <laughs> so what that looks like in a different light, there's your double-stranded DNA. And if I want to make a copy of, I'm only going to copy one strand because I know DNA is double-stranded. I'm going to make a snippet. I'm going to make a copy of one of the sections of DNA. And so if my DNA strand had a T, it would pair up with an A. If it has an A, it would pair up with the U. Now, where I got the U from, this is how your DNA nucleotides pair up. A's with T's and C's with G's. And I think I've got like a, eventually I've got a RNA somewhere. Maybe not. Um, in RNA, the only difference is RNA doesn't have any T's. I don't know why. It has instead a U. It still has C's, it still has G's, it's fine. So the only difference, U and T's look almost identical. They're very, very similar in structure. So if it sees an A, it will bring in a U. So this is my RNA strand. So if there was an A, it would bring in a U because it doesn't have T's. C's and G's still pair up just fine. It just brings in the U instead of a T. From that message, we can then translate it into our chain of amino acids, aka it will become our protein, and it goes and does whatever it needs to do. But we're gonna break it down a little bit. <laughs> um, but that's the basics. 
So transcription, the part that happens in the nucleus or the nucleoid region, depending on the organism, is we are taking the information in DNA and we're just making a copy of it. What helps make that RNA is we need another enzyme. Again, it ends in ACE. And so if it sees a T, it brings in an A. That enzyme, if it sees an A, it brings in a U and so on. And it needs the different RNA nucleotides. It needs the A's, the U's, the C's, and the G's. So it uses an enzyme and it uses the nucleotides and it just brings in each of those letters one at a time. And so ultimately we have our strand of RNA, known as messenger RNA, because it carries a message. Oops. There are a few other things that I don't really care about. I won't ask you about. Now, a little video that's going to show this. And I'll stop it halfway through when it gets done with transcription. It's actually going to show it how it unzips the DNA. And that RNA polymerase is going to bring in the correct nucleotides. It'll bring in a U to pair up with an A, it'll bring in a G to pair up with a C, and so on. And it does it quickly because it's actually shown in real time. The innermost workings of how a simple code so is that's turned your DNA, into flesh a red and blood. Helical shape. This is what Francis Crick called the central dogma of modern biology. How DNA makes protein. It starts with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene. It's these that trigger the first phase of the process, reading off the information that will be needed to make the protein. The gene is the length of DNA stretching away to the left. Everything's ready to roll. Three, two, one. The blue molecule racing along the DNA is reading the gene. It's unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain snaking out of the top is a copy of the genetic message, and it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to make an exact copy of the A's, C's, G's, and T's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related nucleic acid known as U. You are watching this process, called transcription, in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in your body. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes away from the nucleus and... But I'm going to stop it there because then it's going to go into the transcription. Now, you saw how fast it was happening because, again, we need to generate a lot of RNA. We need to generate a lot of proteins in all of our cells to do everything that we need just to sit here and survive. Um, to speed that up, you can have this happening multiple places on the same DNA molecule. So you can, that one enzyme that was reading it, you could have multiple enzymes all lined up, all reading it, making lots of strands of messenger RNA to speed things up. Once we make that message, once we have that information, it can leave the nucleus. And the goal is to make proteins. Do you remember which organelle makes proteins? And it's up on the slide. The ribosome. Ribosome's job is to make proteins. And if our ultimate goal is to make proteins, ribosomes are going to be involved. And so a ribosome is going to take that message, and it's going to read it, and it's going to translate it from the language of A, U, Cs, and Gs into the language of amino acids. That's why they call it translation, because we're changing the language. We're now going from you know, your nucleotides to amino acids. Proteins are made up of amino acids. So we're just changing the language. Nucleotides to amino acids. And it's going to read it three letters at a time. 
So every three letters, and I'm sure this is on one of my next coming uh, slides, is called a codon. That's three nucleotides. And those three nucleotides code for an amino acid. So my example, AUG, these three nucleotides code for the amino acid methionine. CGG codes for the amino acid arginine. UAC codes for tyrosine, UUU codes for leucine. Now Mike, so each one of these, um, the, each one of these you know, three little snippets, these little codons codes for different amino acids. And the ribosome, the thing that's meant to do all this, is what's pulling that messenger RNA through and reading it three letters at a time. Now what actually brings the amino acids into the ribosome to assemble them, we have something known as transfer RNA. Again, his job is to transfer amino acids, and you'll see that happening uh, in the video as well. It's bringing in the amino acids. It knows when the ribosome reads AUG, transfer RNA knows to bring in methionine. Now, the transfer RNA, just different ways that different books can draw out the structure of transfer RNA, how it knows which amino acid to bring in, it's because on one section of the amino acid, it also has a three-letter code that can recognize the codon. Um, it's known as an anticodon because it's always the opposite. So if your RNA, if your RNA had UGG, the opposite of it is ACC. Um, that would be on the tRNA. And so it would know. Anytime it saw a UGG, it's, it's like, oh, well, I, I know what that is because I have the opposite. And it knows which to bring in. So it's not just, you know, it's super smart. It has a code that it recognizes what it's supposed to bring in. Now we do run into somewhat of an issue, is there are 64 different ways to mix around AUs, Cs, and Gs into three-letter chunks. So 64 different combinations to move those three letters. And this is showing all 64 different ways you can mix A, U, Cs, and Gs into three letter codons. So there are 64 different ways, but there's only 20 amino acids. So 64 different combinations for only 20 different amino acids. And so you'll notice that some of the codons, they all code for the exact same amino acid. Because again, 64 different combinations, but only 20 different amino acids. There are also, if you notice on here, of all our 64 combinations, there is one particular codon, AUG, that's known as the start codon. This is where the ribosome knows where to start reading the message. It's like, where's, you know, where's page one of the message? And it knows, as soon as it sees an AUG, it knows where to start, and it brings in the first amino acid, the methionine. That's also why, even on this picture, the first three letters are AUG. It knows to start there, and it brings in methionine. There are also, however, three stop codons, um, which means if the ribosome encounters one of those three stop codons, um, there is no amino acid that codes for that particular three-letter sequence, and it just ends. Now, there's a reason we put a little asterisk in there, because some bacteria do actually have an amino acid for UGA. Us as humans do not, but some pro uh, prokaryotes actually have another amino acid that can be recognized with that stop codon. So it's no longer a stop codon for some bacteria. The ribosome structure in a human, a eukaryote versus a prokaryote, they both do the exact same thing. Our ribosome is just a little bit bigger. But ribosomes are always made up of two little chunks, and you'll see that on the video, you've got two chunks that will come together. Um, ours is just a little bit bigger, it's the only difference. Once that ribosome, these are the two little chunks, once it sees that star codon, it's gonna start right there and it's gonna read three letters at a time and that transfer RNA is gonna bring in the correct amino acid. So we have what's known as initiation, elongation, and termination. Where it's gonna start, the start codon. The elongation is just bringing in all the correct amino acids. And then termination is as soon as it encounters one of those three stop codons or two-stop codons in some prokaryotes. And so we'll continue to read it. 
but also to speed it up because we need lots of protein, you can have more than one ribosome reading the same message. Just like if you had all of the information needed on page, you know, 83 that you made a copy of, you could have multiple of you guys all looking over it trying to read that information. And so even shown on here, if that's your one strand of messenger RNA, you can have multiple ribosomes all attach and all read and all turn out lots and lots of protein very, very quickly. This is showing inside of the ribosome. There are three little sites. There's an A site, a P site, and an E site. And yes, I'm going in reverse. Is because it goes in from the left. It encounters the A. I always think it's approaching. The P is where it's actually assembling the amino acids. So the P is for peptide, because it's binding them together with a peptide bond. And E is where it exits. That's where it goes. Um, so it's actually read backwards. It spells ape backwards. This is showing how you can have lots of ribosomes all reading the same messenger RNA. And you can churn out so much more protein that way. It's way more efficient if you can have multiple ribosomes reading that same message. Here's the actual picture of it. So here's a true picture of one messenger RNA and all the ribosomes that are attached to it and all of that uh, new chain of amino acids snaking out of it. It's cool. I love it when you can actually get real pictures of it. Now, the little video showing it, again, in real time, I got to The innermost. Ahead. It snakes away from the nucleus and into the outer part of the cell. This is where it's going to encounter that ribosome. Then, in a dazzling display of choreography, two chunks that all the components of another molecular machine lock together around the RNA to form a miniature factory called a ribosome. There's the other. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. The amino acids are the small red tips attached to the transfer molecules. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids. They all carry a specific three-letter code that will be read by the machine. Now we come to the heart of the process. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. The code for each amino acid is read off, three letters at a time, and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecule. When the right transfer molecule plugs in, the amino acid it carries is added to the growing protein chain. Again, you are watching this in real time. And after a few seconds, the assembled protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make any kind of protein. It just depends what genetic message you feed in on the RNA. In this case, the end product is hemoglobin. The cells in our bone marrow churn out a hundred trillion molecules of it per second. A hundred trillion molecules per second. So you think of how many, you know, trillions of molecules you've made just while well, you sat here in class today. Um, so again, it can happen very, very quickly, and you can have more than one ribosome reading it as well. Helps us speed it up. Now, just comparing what these transcription and translation in a prokaryote versus eukaryote, the big thing is, again, we're going to unzip it. You're going to make messenger RNA from that original DNA. In a prokaryote, this just happens in the nucleoid region because they don't have a nucleus. It makes that messenger RNA, and you can have multiple ribosomes reading it, making lots and lots of protein. Same basic idea in a eukaryotic cell, except that first making of the messenger RNA happens inside the nucleus, because our cells have nuclei. Um, and it makes that messenger RNA. It will leave the nucleus. It will find some ribosomes. They, again, you can have multiple ribosomes attaching to it, and you can make multiple strains of that protein. Um, nascent protein just means a growing strain or a growing chain. Um, and so it's eventually growing and it will eventually fold and shape into the exact protein of, that our cells need. Now, this is what you're going to be partly doing on that worksheet, 
is I give you a strand of DNA on the worksheet. Uh, and then I give you the DNA. You're going to have to tell me the RNA. So the A's, the U's, the C's, and the G's. You're going to need to use this particular table and figure out what amino acids there are. Now, how to read the table. So the if we'll just start with, I don't know, first one, AUG. Um, if your sequence is AUG, if the first letter is A, on the left-hand side, if the first letter is A, you find the A. If the second letter is a U, on the top is where the second base is, so you find the U. So you know you're going to be in the third row, first column. And if your last letter is a G, we're way over here, you know, it has all four letters on the right-hand side. If it's the G, you're in the bottom row, so A-U-G. I can't remember if I put another one, an example or trial on here. Um, there's a couple other different models out there that will use like circle charts to figure it out. Um, when you write it in, please just write the three letter abbreviation. <laughs> Otherwise you're gonna have to write really small. One tip for doing this as well, because it does read three letters at a time, I usually recommend drawing lines between every three letters. Otherwise, I can't tell you how many times you guys do a couple mutations on accident because you skipped a letter um, or you read a letter twice. So it's helpful to actually draw um, the lines between all three letters. Now, my also note, because I always have lots of questions, um, I give you the wild type is the original strain. So this is like the normal strain. And this is the beginning sequence of the enzyme that makes lactase, that thing that can break down lactose. It is, however, the beginning of the strand. Um, so it will not end in a stop codon. So our students are like, but it's the end. It should have a stop. Yes. Um, the actual DNA strand that codes for the enzyme lactase is 55,000 bases long. I'm not going to write all 55,000 and make you do that. So I just give you like the first small section. So no, there is no stop codon because it doesn't go to the end. Um, your strain A, B, and C, I did a mutation to them. You're still going to have to, you know, figure it all out, but based on the mutation, which we're going to go over right now, you know, can it still make the enzyme lactose based on the type of mutation? So, mutations. What happens if during transcription or during translation something doesn't, you know, happen correctly? That's a mutation. A mutation is any change in the DNA. Now, our cells, in bacterial cells, do have checkpoints that if something happens, that a mutation happens, it can either, one, go back and fix it, or two, it will just kill the cell so that we don't keep that incorrect cell replicating. And so huge, you know, major mutations are pretty rare. Usually any change from the normal will kill the cell. Bodies are meant to set up, recognize mutations. And those mutations can't do something, and the cell will die. It rarely leads to an improvement, but on some cases it can. And it becomes very evident in bacteria, that some bacteria can actually acquire mutations, so they replicate so fast. They can acquire mutations that sometimes are good because those mutations may allow them to survive an antibiotic. If a mutation is good, it can increase the likelihood of an organism living, which is natural selection. It's that they acquire something beneficial that allows them to survive. A gross mutation versus a point mutation. A gross mutation just means a large change in the DNA. A point mutation means one letter is changed. So instead of an A, all of a sudden there was a random C that showed up and it was supposed to be an A. So a point mutation is just one letter change. Everyone's like, well, that's not so bad. <laughs> it can be, though, when you have one letter change. Because there are different kinds of point mutations, because I ask about this on the worksheet, so I want to make sure I go through it. So if this is your normal strand at the very, very top, that's your, it's known as the wild type, your normal strand. It has the normal DNA, the normal messenger RNA, and the normal amino acids that would get brought in based on that RNA uh, sequence. So the first three letters are A, A, A. But what if all of a sudden that third letter is no longer an A, it's a G? It's just one letter change. Well, okay, so I'll 
I have a G on my DNA, so I'll bring in a C when I make messenger RNA. And then instead of UUU, I now have UUC, and I bring in an amino acid, it's the phenylalanine. But did my amino acid sequence change? No. And so we call this a silent mutation. The DNA is still different, but the same amino acid still gets brought in. So ultimately, there is no change in the protein. It's still a mutation, but there's no change in the actual protein itself. So let's see, if you're going to have a point mutation, it's the best one to have. Now, a missense mutation, we just go farther along down the end, um, kind of above that ALA with CGT. Well, instead of the G, it now has a C here. So we changed the DNA right there. And so instead of bringing in a C, I have to bring in a G. And instead of bringing alanine, I now have to bring in glycine. This is known as a missense mutation. Everything else stays the same except one amino acid. So the phenylalanine is the same, tyrosine is the same, arginine is They're all the same. It's just one amino acid is brought in. And I was like, well, that's not so bad. Well, sickle cell anemia is actually one letter. Sickle cell anemia is a missense mutation. One amino acid is brought in that's incorrect. Change the whole protein. So one small little amino acid change can be deadly. There's still my original up there. A nonsense mutation. So I have like four A's, a T, and an A. Well, here's my four A's, but in, I have a T, and instead of an A, I have a T. So there's my one point mutation there. So it brings in an A where it wasn't supposed to. And this three-letter sequence, UAA, doesn't code for tyrosine anymore because I was UAU codes for a stop codon. So a nonsense mutation is all of a sudden you made a mutation that coded for a stop codon. That's going to be extremely detrimental because that means the rest of that RNA is not going to get read because that ribosome is just going to stop. So one point mutation, one letter change can actually be very detrimental. And then when we have our frame shift mutations, we have one letter change but we can either add an extra letter in or remove a letter. And so here I had my A-A-A-T-A. -A -A well, here's my A-A-A-T-A, -A but I'm going to throw in an extra T where there wasn't one. That means if I throw an extra letter in and you read this thing three letters at a time, everything else after that shifts over by one letter, which means after that mutation, every other amino acid after that is going to be incorrect. The same type of thing as if I removed that T and I shift everything over one, every amino acid is going to be incorrect after that because I shifted everything over and it's always read three letters at a time. You remove a letter, you mess up all those three letter codons. So mutations, and I'm like, although point mutations is just one letter change, they can be extremely harmful. Now, there are different kinds of mutations. Spontaneous mutations, as their name implies, just happen. A mutagen, though, based on its name, the gen means generating, mute means mutation. These are things that generate mutations. You'll see these are things that cause mutations to occur. Radiation can cause mutations to occur. This, depending if you damage DNA, could lead to cancer. Um, chemical mutations can also cause DNA to change. We can start changing um, the nucleotides. We can start changing the A's, T's, C's, and G's. And my little bit on terminology, a mutant is something that has a mutation. And the wild type, as I kind of already mentioned, is what the original strand is. This is my last slide. So mutations themselves are pretty rare just because our cells can usually recognize them and then go back and fix them. However, those mutagens, such as radiation or different types of chemicals, can increase the chance of mutations happening. Um, 10 to 1,000 times mutations are more likely with different types of mutagens. So if you ever see anything, ah, oh, this can cause cancer, ah, oh, it's, it's a mutagen, it's something that can change the DNA. So I will record the last little bit, which isn't too much. <laughs>